Allow me to take you back to the distant past of 2013. The eighth generation of consoles are just getting acquainted with our living rooms, the Wii U is doing the best that it can, and a couple of way forward devs think to themselves, man, I sure do like Zelda too, then proceed to make one of the best games ever. We saw an extreme divide in the gaming marketplace. AAA companies began stuffing microtransactions in every corner that they could, while indie teams saw the birth of the crowdfunded game. The concept is ingenious. If a small team or even a solo dev have a good enough idea, we could all chip in and make that game a reality. With the benefit of hindsight, we know it ain't that simple, but one thing is certain. There are two legendary games that began their Kickstarter campaign this year, and today I'm going to talk about the one that does not get hundreds of millions of views. It's your boy, Shovel Knight! You couldn't ask for a more righteous victory. A scruffy crew hitting us with a great idea than releasing the game on every console known to man. I own most of them. Every time I see it on sale, I can't stop myself from grabbing another copy. Dang. Where am I? You would think that a simple 2D game would be pretty straightforward to talk about, but this title is so extremely dense with incredible content that I will be breaking every major section of the game with a deep dive into one of its core components. That being said, major spoilers for the entirety of this game, but it should go without saying that I super recommend that you play it first. Let's begin. The game kicks in like an NES original, straight up title and theme song. Something about this story selection reminds me of those arcade cabinets from the 90s, somewhere in the smooth flowing pixels meeting the bright pastel colors. It's a nice effect. The only story we're focusing on today is Shovel of Hope. Trust me, it'll be enough. Introductions are simple but effective. You play as a knight wielding a shovel. You once had a relationship with a shield knight, but that was torn away at the Tower of Fate. This sends our protagonist into a downward spiral and allows evil to rise up. We begin our adventure as the titular knight, ready to rise once again. Now, let's talk about the unspoken words on display. The very moment you gain control, you can see the Tower of Fate deep into the horizon, and a dirt pile directly in front of you. Dig and tell Castle. Easy peasy. After said digging, you run into an enemy, and the same method works flawlessly. Then you get this nice, bumpy landscape to get a handle in your jump and plow maneuvers. On the next screen, you learn the downward plunge, which makes this whole wide world go round. This one maneuver turns your jump into a vertical attack that can also double as a semi-safe platforming technique, and you'll need to demonstrate that on the very next screen. You hit a checkpoint, dunk on a few moving platforms until you run into a dragon that can be defeated quite easily if you've been paying attention. Down this cave, you'll find a deviation in the wall, signifying a hidden path. The next one you see will have a few enemies crawling in them, so they're not always safe. Using that lesson, you find your first music sheet, showing you that there will be collectibles outside of the treasure on display. Later on, you'll see that you missed a treasure chest and learned that some breakable walls are not marked, which is honestly devious. The next screen presents dirt blocks and gold in a way that shows that you can miss out on a reward if you're not planning ahead. Couple that with a silver platter turning over food for health and you've got most of the basics down. From this point, they take all of these lessons and beautifully weave new scenarios, reintroducing enemies and elevation with newfound difficulty at a perfectly slow pace. It only took them three minutes to have you feel confident in your ability to play this game, and the rest is just excellent level design. I love this secret area where the main obstacle is that it hurts my eyes to look at it, but it's really cool to see that we're climbing up the core of a waterfall. This all culminates with a boss fight. You'll always find a checkpoint and a turkey beforehand, just like in real life. Our first real fight, and it's against the Black Knight, a slick, dark version of our character. He taunts us, saying our quest is futile in the face of the Enchantress's evil powers, but we take to battle dauntlessly. 
As you might expect from a tutorial boss, the Black Knight is no match for our down air. The fight finishes, the victorious music plays, and the Tower of Fate is that much closer within our grasp. As we rest for the night, we scream into the skyline to find Shield Knight falling from the stars. In a sea of haze, we are only given one objective. Though when we jump to make our long-awaited contact, we stir awake just before the reunion. This simple act shows how much our hero cares for Shield Knight far more than any words ever could. We jump up, put out the smoldering bonfire, then the real quest begins. Our path splits into four choices, but I would be hard-pressed to believe anybody wouldn't pick the village first. The guard calls us a manlet and lets us know that we can speak to people by pressing up. This is right out of Zelda 2, but with ridiculous detail. They didn't cut any corners at the art department. Every no-name character has a striking design, but you'll be naturally drawn to the stationary citizens. This bard closes the loop on what we can do with the music sheets. Each one you return bags you 500 gold. I generally hold on to these pieces until I really need a cash injection, leading to these little moments where he's stoked to see me, and I completely ignore him. Molly boosts our confidence and sets us up for the upgrade loop. You got your health, mana, and your goat wizard. The goat Titian can sell you meal tickets to increase your health, while the Magisus just needs you to have something to channel magic into. The final piece of this puzzle lies between these three dudes. The traveling merchant that sells you magic items, a devout follower of something called the Trowpel King, and a frog that makes terrible jokes. The quintessential trifecta. Breaking down a few secrets shows that a music piece is hidden in this room, and there's also Mona. You can play a minigame where you attempt to hit bumpers with vials. You see, the shovel does a lot more than dig dirt and flip bugs. There are many occasions where a well-timed attack will parry an object, something I generally forget about doing. Just like in Dark Souls. In the last section of the town, you'll find a handful of people, another music sheep, and a final send-off from the Grizzled Seer. It's time to make your first big decision. Who will you fight first? I mean, King Knight, obviously. Ride more keep, a castle made of pure gold. You know that old Metroidvania move of going to the left? Super pays off here. They even drop a fancy little plaque for Yacht Club right at the end. You're gonna see a lot of verticality in this stage with these molten cauldrons while keeping on your toes with these mini chariots. It cannot go without saying how much I love these little propeller rats. Something about the complacent look on their face, it just absolutely gets me. Choosing a tricky path allows me to talk about two mechanics, in-level items and the death run. When Chester's not in the village, he's somewhere neck deep in a level. If you're keen on following hidden spots, you can find a new item at a discount. Most of the time, it's the exact thing you need to get the advantage on your current stage. I bungled these chandeliers, so I must die. If you fall into a pit, spike, or get bopped too many times, you drop three satchels of your current wealth. You get one chance to secure the bag, and if you can't reach them or you die again, it's gone forever. Just like in Dark Sometimes you'll notice secret areas when it's too late to get to them. Unless you're an Unreal Gaming prodigy, but hey, what can I say? For the last third of the stage, they introduce these gnarly magic books that activate page platforms. Once you get a handle on that, you'll be dodging around cauldrons in a troublesome tandem. It's so nice to ascend a giant, foreboding castle filled to the brim with ornate, color-coordinated enemies. Most of them are built to catch you off guard at first, but with appropriate practice, you can finally reach the pinnacle to fight the armor-clad ruler. Just like rolling up on this boss gives us our first genuine musical banger of the game. Decadent Dandy is an amazing high-speed Baroque piece that bleeds the feeling of royal combat, all bubbling up from King Knight, as regal as he is deadly. To win this fight, you have to, ah. 
Yeah, any boss that stays on the ground is kind of a cakewalk, which is always a bummer here as you never really get a chance to hear the entire song. Finishing up this fight, you'll start to see these world events. Heading back to the first level gives you a chance to bulk up on your cash flow, giving you a perfect opportunity to ignore the bard and buy some food. Let's break away from the main game to talk about a cornerstone of this title, graphics. This game absolutely excels in the color palettes, sterling gold striking against the dusky purple, a patient backdrop to the Hall of the Keep. Almost every level strikes a firm stance in its defining colors, usually a tasteful contrast with a real confidence to impress with style over continuity. Any game that is willing to do a silhouette level knows it looks good, and this title is no different, proving that amazing palettes don't mean much without excellent borders. On that, I absolutely love Shovel Knight's design. Perfectly simple, with just enough added to the way he carries himself to get a personality across. Every move he makes casts a heroic shadow with a twinge of boastful comedy. If you ever decide to press down, he does the most minuscule squat, only truly useful when you're vibing to the soundtrack. And that's just one night. The same level of detail goes for every member of the Order of No Quarter. King spewing horns, the menacing slice of Spectre, the verticality of Propeller, it all makes for a consistently interesting experience. For a pixel-style game, you see a ridiculous amount of animation. From small baddies to lumbering beasts, everything seems to move at its own pace, humming to a telegraphic rhythm for each attack. Moving forward, I hope you'll see how impressive everything pieces together to make a striking and smooth experience. But before we go to the next stage, I have something very important to show you. You see, this is the Trowpel King, like that guy with the cups was talking about. Without any kind of payment or show of goodwill, he is ready to give you amazing power-ups. But first, you gotta watch the dance. There's something so refreshing about a game that can trust you enough to just breathe. It reminds me a lot of that moment in Earthbound. I don't want to spoil it, but if you know, you know. Just a complete vibe check. After all that, we are ready to rock with Spectre Knight. Anyone who knows me knows I love Castlevania. Old school or exploration, I am in there. This stage perfectly nails that lively, macabre vibe so rarely done right. Rolling through a moody town deep into a crypt, mixing the moving platforms against the complete blackout with these horrendous skeletal platforms, it's all a huge step up as far as difficulty goes. The hidden item in this stage is the Phase Locket, which will be one of the most integral items of your playthrough. It offers momentary invulnerability, which can be a saving grace in a pinch. There are three gems over there that I never figured out how to obtain, but I feel too embarrassed to look it up. Email me, physically mail me, if you know how to get these gems. Go to the post office. The last area is the trickiest with unfortunate bad guy placement, but a patient hand will get you through. And that goes double for the actual fight against Spectre Knight. If you aren't keen on your magic at this point, you will get absolutely rocked. But with the flame wand, this battle is in the bag. 
This will prompt another dream sequence, but this time you have a bunch of dudes trying to bonk you. They drop a ridiculous amount of money, but I ain't never let this lady fall and I don't plan on starting now. You get a meal ticket on the house and head back to the village. Not today. Now that we have a few magical tools under our belt, it's important to understand another piece to this brilliant puzzle, movement. It's about to become critical that you understand how many options you have, many of which are never outright explained to you. When you move back and forth, you'll notice there's a slight pause in between each motion. This is deliberate as most of your usual actions are instantaneous. Not only does this give your two-dimensional character a superb sense of weight, it's also a clue towards the mentality of how you can actually move. A lot of your time spent dying will be caused by underestimating your surroundings, mostly due to your intentionally limited horizontal movement. You can clear a great distance, sure, but the moment they tighten up your hallway, that mobility is completely out of the window. So what can you do? A whole hell of a lot, actually. We just saw the phase locket, which will award you a generous amount of free time to walk through and over danger. Later on, you'll find the Dust Knuckles, which is a perfect fix for a blocked passage provided some kind of earth is in our way. Our trajectory can rise and fall based on what direction you input while punching. Later, this will be a godsend on rising floor challenges. Although, both of these are made somewhat redundant with the propeller knife, which closes the gap on our traversal woes, but it's wonderful to see that they made elements to this game that are especially designed with additional effects to those willing to experiment. The levels themselves can put a great twist on our ability to move. Our next boss lives in the ocean, which gives a beautifully buoyant edge to our jump. We'll also see an ice stage that is somehow not annoying, and a floating level that somehow is. Not to mention, with a few achievements based around our ability to juggle plunges, they definitely expect you to be able to handle your aerial attacks. Combine that with the frankly overpowered attack upgrades down the line, and you'll find this game is more of a pogo smacking simulation more than anything else. At first, it's shocking to see such a simple looking platformer have depth like a fighting game, but with enough patience, it creates a flow state that hooks your gamer, gamer instinct. instinct. Hey, it wouldn't be a throwback game without an obligatory water level, but the actual framing here is fantastic. We submerge ourselves into the carcass of an iron whale with a beautiful contrast between sky-touched blue and harsh bronze interiors. We start seeing more intentional trappings as far as obstacles go, creating a balance between the frenetic gameplay and fully understanding our surroundings to ensure that we don't SD. You start to see the hue cast into a murky purple as you cascade through the environment, leading to the sandy bottom of the sea floor. You'd think they would have hidden this merchant chest better, and yeah, they definitely did. This torpedo section always feels amazing. You'll learn how to activate the missile by the lever, then they make sure you know these walls can be broken, then immediately toss you into this frantic airborne razor edge section directly into the boss. Remember what I said about horizontal fights? Yeah, we'll keep it moving. Luckily for the bard, we are finally cashing in. Conquering Treasure Knight opens up a new town with armor and shovel upgrades. It's a clever move holding these power-ups until the second act as you would have plenty of time to get your head around the basics just to introduce some quality of life changes. As for the armor, let's be real here. The Dynamo Mail is head and shoulders above all the others. Every time I double dip on the downstrike, I get a super powered attack. Pair that with our new charge attack and you have absolutely disgusting damage. Perfect for us to tap into some side content. First, let's talk about the Wandering Strangers. Reese is a boomerang ninja type that mistakes us for a member of the Order of No Quarter. A particularly tough fight if you're relying on the downward strike. And that goes double for Baz, a massive dude that's having a temper tantrum about not being invited to the bad guy table. He hopes that beating you will guarantee him a seat, and his whip makes for an intensely vertical fight with a built-in shield from our plunge. 
he accepts defeat with about as much stride as I do. There's a rematch with the Black Knight, revealing that he is in league with the Enchantress, only concerned with her safety. This showdown introduces many more projectiles, but with a little bravery you can parry your way to a second victory. In the latter half of the story, you'll find the Phantom Striker, who doesn't even come up with a reason to fight. He has a lethal fencing style and can summon lightning, creating a danger zone from above as well as a wave in either direction. This is another case of fight quickly or suffer harshly. Outside of the random encounters, we have substantial yet secret content. At the Armor Outpost, you'll find the Hat Store. These three grifters run us for 3,000 gold and leave us to face the hat-obsessed shopkeeper, dead set to steal our signature headwear. This is a super flashy fight. You can tell the style of attack he'll send out based on which hat he puts on, and overall it feels like a mix between fighting Raz and Reese, requiring a strong amount of reaction time. Once he realizes that we're wearing a helmet and not a hat, he apologizes, and we leave 2,000 gold richer. Then, you have the Hall of Champions, which is a ridiculous experience. This peacock tells us we can't go in unless we toss 5k into the mix, and the moment we pay up, they lock the door behind us. Turns out, it's a haunted house, filled to the brim with the ghosts we saw back at Spectre Knight's level. You'll find that these crystal orbs are the only way to defeat the spooky dudes, having a cross-style projectile that can be tricky to time. A cleared room illuminates with the visage of Kickstarter backers. I cannot describe to you how much I wish my stupid face was on one of these walls. Once you exercise each room, you get one final boss. A giant ghost with only two orbs to chip away any damage. And you already know that this fight gets the Certified Banger Award. Backed into a corner is a ridiculous pulse-pounding track. Taking the traditional vibrating synth you see in most horror music and bumping the BPM through the roof, the drums break across these searing six-note arpeggiations to perfectly grab the intensity of the fight. This song will eternally live in my workout mix. You would have thought the Hall of Heroes was enough secret content by itself, but there's a distinct reason why I'm playing the PS4 version of this game. So. In the bonus content, you'll find a secret room, and in this secret room, you'll find another even more secret room where you can only find it by doing what I believe is the only ground-based hidden wall, and in there you'll find a scroll with the Omega symbol. Doing this will spawn a new stranger encounter, which turns out to be Kratos from God of War. I figured the console exclusive fight would be somewhat phoned in, but this is one of the most intricate and game-changing encounters of the entire story. This is a three-phase battle ending with this ridiculous collapse down chunks of pillars against an enormous mountainside. The victory earns us the Gravedigger shovel, which after some handiwork is completely destroyed and then turned into the Armor of Chaos. In my opinion, this is the single best upgrade you can get. What you lose in continuous bouncing, you gain in nearly infinite horizontal movement. Your magic turns into rage, making the once tricky combat a complete non-issue. It is so unbelievably game-changing that I will not be using it for the remainder of the story. But with everything said, I hope that I have illustrated how above and beyond the additional content in this game is. I don't know who was in charge of this part of development, but they absolutely popped off. What better place for a shoveler than underground? The Lost City offers a grand array of differing geography to cut through, introducing sand blocks, which you can dive directly through, and explosive blocks that are self-explanatory. As far as fauna, you'll see how lava alters many of the mainstay baddies we've seen so far. The green goos now present way more damage. This also leads to a clever section where you turn the magma tides into slime, turning instant death into intense hops. The other enemies are incredibly innovative with the theme of the level. Firefish, Energy Falcons, Sekiro bosses, Reinhardt mains, it's all here. 
Something about these bouncy beetles just completely turns my brain off. I could never seem to plan ahead once you add jumping into the mix. Luckily, this is the level where you get the knuckle dusters. By getting those, once you get to Mole Knight, you should have everything you need to win. Still, it's an excellent end to a tricky stage, all set to the pounding beat of one of the best song transitions, turning an underlying problem into the claws of fate. Okay, that was a weak segue, but I have held off on this topic for far too long. Above the brilliant level design, characters, challenge, and everything in between, the foremost thing I love in this game is the soundtrack. Though it's never been my generation, I take a strong liking to chiptune music. Something in the transformation of synthesized music to its simplest form brings out the absolute best in a composition. I'd wager the catchiest, most nostalgic tunes come from the 8-bit era, only amplified by the 16-bit boost just after. Shovel Knight is not just a homage to the genre, but a supersession. In ambient moments, you hear the flex strings fly over the buzzing bass, encouraging a mystery and pooling your expectations. Levels can sway from a regal symphony to a breakbeat catastrophe, all set to the pulsing backbeat and genuinely wild percussion. You'll often find boss battles stack a measure in a way that feels like a monsoon of tone building to a frenzy just to crash into you with the resolve. Honestly, I could wax poetic about this for a lifetime, but I just want to thank Jake Kaufman for his incredible work here. More than making an amazing score, he was able to transfer a level of passion and originality to this OST that I don't think more than a handful of people have done. Speaking of which, one of the Kickstarter goals was to get Manami Matsume to compose a few original tracks. You may be wondering who that is, which is a huge disservice from Capcom. She wrote the score for Mega Man 1 and 2, and is only retroactively credited for, you know, Mega Man music. Both of these musicians were able to blend their styles to the story of this game so well that I genuinely find it hard to tell which track she did. I will be playing the pieces she wrote in the background of this video, so please leave a comment if you can tell which ones belong to her. Outside of that, even if you decide a game like this isn't for you, just listen to the OST. Pop it on while you're going on a walk or doing the dishes. You'll feel like a brand new person. The Explodatorium, home of the Plague Knight and his many experiments. This stage expertly illustrates what it expects from you in a quick-fire sequence, but that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. We're talking flame pillars, exploding rats, angry birds, not to mention some of the wildest platforming so far. These little Totoro guys are the bane of my existence, truly horrendous behavior from my neighbor. And while we're opening from a cluttered laboratory setting, the guys quickly fall to this ultra neon potion background. I am all about this. Yacht Club is showing a confidence in their design to not worry about setting and choose striking imagery over the standard science schmience background. It's fun to see these ghostly mimics. The first guy seems so useless until your confidence wanes in a death from above situation. And eventually, you will fight Plague Knight. And I wouldn't say this fight is difficult, but the ever-crumbling ground with the randomized obstacles makes for a spirited race to victory. Now, before every boss that I have any confidence in, I always like to bust the checkpoint. Three reasons why. I like to live dangerously, the animation is top-notch, and it's a perfect example of the treasure in this campaign. It's rare to find a game that has a genuinely meaningful reward system. What can you really offer a player to make sure they're exhausting every nook and cranny? Gold, of course. Yeah, in the simplest sense, this game is stuffed to the brim with treasure. Gold, gems, jewels, trinkets, chest with bustable locks and dirt speckled with the shiny stuff our basic instincts crave. They took special care to make the experience of finding treasure phenomenal. You rifle through lockboxes and fling treasure all around you. You break checkpoints with a boast of confidence for a higher payout, all set to a sound that will never get old. 
And outside of that, there's valuables just chilling everywhere. Entire levels dedicated to their acquisition, sometimes actually leading you to further rewards in hidden rooms. But it's not enough to just have a lot of gold. You gotta use it. I'm happy to say that the effort is completely worth it. Your time and energy always pays off. Health, mana, weapons, armor, skills, additional fights and areas, you can never go wrong with an investment. The loop is so impressively satisfying that even after you buy literally everything, you can't help but get excited at the prospect to keep your collection growing. I think you get the point. It's extremely fun to get caught in one of these loops, and this game is no different. Welcome to the third zone. They definitely saved the hardest nights for last. Up first, we have Tinker Knight, a tiny little engineer guy who decided to spec his entire workshop into a platforming nightmare. From the beefy welders to the cog traversal, this stage will demolish you if your platforming is not tight. But in doing so, this is the most forgettable stage in the game, which is quite a feat when you consider it has an entire motorized dueling sequence and ends with an elevator scramble. And while the stage isn't extremely noteworthy, the boss battle sure is. There's a slick little trick using the item from the stage here. You can knock him out with just one wheel. Of course, this is just a fake out. The real battle is against his majestic metal doomsayer. I won't even front with you. I accidentally did this fight damageless, and I will never be able to do it again. And I know some of you must be thinking that a lot of the praise I'm shooting here was done in another game or lacks originality when compared to your favorite game, so let's talk about a few references that I noticed. Rotating doors in the shape of the main character. You can catch that in Zelda. Giant enemy guarding the way forward, that's Mega Man. Mid-level bosses, that's also Mega Man. Then you have a blue character, eight stages, boss rush, soundtrack, multiple attack styles, hybrid water level, fake out final stage. I'm gonna stop myself here, but I think we know which series this game would ask to prom. I need to make it very clear that this game doesn't hide in the shadow of Mega Man, instead taking the aspects of what made that series so excellent and transferring it into a unique form that I believe is far more palatable for the current landscape. What do I mean by that? Mega Man is really hard and makes me want to scream. Does that mean Shovel Knight is too easy? Probably. But with an addition of a hard mode and self-creating difficulty in the checkpoints, that becomes a non-issue. Also, this isn't a deadly premonition kind of deal. Yacht Club has always been upfront about the influences this game has and chooses to scream them from the rooftops of design, giving us the best of the past with the polish of the present. I sure hope you enjoyed my miraculous gamer energy back at Tinker's stage because it's about to rapidly recede. Welcome to the Flying Machine, home of the elegant Propeller Knight. If the best songs are used on the hardest stages, this must be the greatest song ever made. The main obstacles we'll encounter is wind and a severe lack of floor. Now you may be thinking, ah, it can't be that bad, just a little gust pushing you back and forth, just adjust your landing. First off, how dare you talk to me like that, and secondly, it pushes you upward, then swaps what kind of wind you're dealing with. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but just watch. Thematically, I still love this level. You have this brilliant amber sunset, the interior of the ship is a gilded cyan of intricate patterns, the Tower of Fate is looming so close now, and we have the absolutely enormous return of the Propeller Rats. I would love this level if it didn't hate me so much. As you can expect, the final fight is a complete banger all framed around a burning twilight sun where the mid-boss reappears to completely ruin your day with cannonballs. Even in victory, I cannot seem to avoid dying.
outside of this absolute gatekeep of a level, one of my soft complaints about this game is its challenge, which in full honesty is a personal preference versus an actual flaw. I think it has more to do with experience. A first time playthrough is wrought with learning experience, and in that way they really couldn't punish you heavily as it would discourage new players. Once you get your head fully wrapped around the mechanics, you start to see through the lines of opportunity and crack the combat's code. The dominant strategy shines through a lot of encounters and makes for a sadly brief experience. How many games do you wish that you could play for the first time again? I imagine that list is slim. I definitely know a few, but I tend to think that a secondary level of knowledge ultimately benefits this game. The same way a melee player creates their own ethos of combat, not in the story, but in a self-defined tournament, we no longer defensively squeeze through levels, but glide unbothered through masterfully designed worlds. Now, how many games do you know so well that they become your comfort playthrough when you just need to process through something you never get tired of replaying? I imagine that list is even slimmer. What's more, we haven't even touched the core of this story yet, which, as we'll soon see, makes a great experience an unforgettable one. Here we are, the last member of the Order of No Quarter. Somewhere nested deep in a forgotten ship lays Polar Knight. There's a reason why I chose to hold this fight till the very end. It's the only battle that strikes a strangely somber tone. The environment is surprisingly fun for an ice level. Northern Lights welcomes our adventure to the guts of a beset hull. The enemies here are fierce, but by this point you should have enough magic under your belt to handle any situation. Especially the horn they offer here, just a screen clearing item that costs entirely too much mana. I adore it. The rainbow pukesicles can be tricky to traverse, but one time I saw a speedrun where they do this slick maneuver to lead them from the front, so I suggest you do that as well. By the time you reach Polar Knight, it's revealed that you and him once had a strong friendship, turned toxic by the evil Enchantress's will. You get this feeling that the Stoic Knight never intended to be evil, but chose to be the devil's right hand in the stead of being in his way. And that's a quote from the mummy. Anyways, if you don't get this fight over with quickly, it gets ugly. Old boy is quick and can crush the ice to reveal spikes, but luckily, it's another horizontal playing field, so we can wrap this up without worry. There's a lot to be said about how characters are portrayed in this game. Like you would expect, most citizens you run into will have this boastful, jesting vibe to them. Knights bark orders, farmers banter, maidens threaten, all the craftspeople you meet don't work for free, but are happy to help for the right price. The more unique NPCs have this really strange humor. Trowpel King is a seriously helpful, if not boisterous, leader. All of the traveling challengers have something to gain from wiping you out and begin their fight with unnecessary confidence. It all makes for a lightly romanticized medieval surface. Then you have the Order. King's opulence makes way for a satisfying humiliation. Spectre's overconfidence silences with your might. Treasure's engrossed greed is rightfully revoked. Mole's single focus leads to a blind overwhelming. Plague's giddy malfeasance gets him stuffed into a locker. Tinker doesn't even seem to know that he's a bad guy, but his machines certainly do. And Propeller, what can I say? The guy's just vibing in the sky. Total Chad. Then there's Polar, a dark reflection of your own quest. His rotting ship and willingness to give to dark influences culminates to a life spent waiting in the past, poisoned by bitter emotions. This cavalcade is led by the Enchantress, a pure force of uncontrollable evil, the gloomy fire that looms over the land, tendrils seeping through the ground, corrupting all that lays bare. To me, it's not so much her evil ways that makes her such an effective antagonist, but her inevitability. You see this mostly with the Black Knight. While he may be strong enough on his own, 
she knows it's only a matter of time before he's swallowed up into her dark machine. In actuality, the Enchantress doesn't pay us any attention. In her mind, we're just another lost soul, broken by the loss of our significant other and destitute in the path of complete global saturation. And just as a star is a dot on an infinite canvas, we are just a single speck in the grand design, but one that cannot be quelled with cheap rewards. While a silent protagonist can be effective, look at the way Shovel Knight treats the world around him, completely against all odds yet always willing to extend a hand in resolution. Always choosing peace before a fight yet gracious in all victories, kind to the people around him, for the most part, and willing to tackle the greatest of challenges even when no reward is offered. This is the fire that burns brightly between both of us and fueling this final showdown. The Tower of Fate is at our fingertips. The overworld music grows deeply ominous, signaling that this is the last chance to make sure you've maxed out your health and mana. Personally, I love the Dynamo Mail giving me the remarkably overpowered attack, but for this finale, I think we should go with maximum steam. Quick disclaimer, for some reason when I went to record this part of the game on console, it decided to have this graphical stutter. Not enough to impede the gameplay, but just enough for it to be extremely annoying. This is one of the best looking parts of any game I've played, so I doubled back on an old PC save to re-record the ending, but Nvidia thought it would be a really cool guy and watermark my footage, so sorry, or you're welcome, whichever works best for you. Welcome to the Gauntlet of Gauntlets. You will be tested in every lesson you've learned so far. Any enemy you've seen now has a stronger variation. Every platforming section has a devious machination. We are at the gates of the Tempest, banging our unwelcome fists for a resolution. Now, this first stage is an all-out jumping marathon, a dense cacophony of split-second planning and razor-sharp accuracy. Most of the time, you'll just get squashed. The boardwalk strikes a stark silhouette, forcing these CQC moments across betraying ledges and terrible gaps. I am still in awe of how amazing they made this ostensive 16-bit game look. We meet with the Black Knight for one final duel. Here we see that in actuality, he has been trying to protect us from the corrupting darkness and has never sided with the Enchantress. In a final moment of dissolved will, he is forced into her dark materials and reborn a phoenix of shadow. With a surprisingly quick dispatch, he finally levels with us, revealing that he has been trying to save someone, someone that we know. He gives us the way forward, warning that we cannot hurt them. Everybody, give it up to the Black Knight. What I imagine everyone thought would be a throwaway tutorial boss turning out to have a three-phase conflicted anti-hero arc, truly putting up unheard of numbers. Within the castle, you will be tested on your fighting prowess. Ergo, do these fights in super cramped corridors. That is, until we get back to the rainbow pukesicles. I bet this would be really tough if you had to do it the normal way. I couldn't even imagine. We also get the return of the elevating screen of death, this time with an egregious dirt breaking section. These shadow samurais just love ruining your day. We gather some food and make our descent. After all the trials and all of the bosses we've slain, there is nothing that can get in our way to stop us. Oh, I mean, what kind of platform adventure game would this be without a boss rush? Looking at my original footage, it's awesome to see that the order you fight the order in is actually randomized. Luck is on our side here. A lot of the stage-specific hazards are completely gone, and we get a heal before every fight, which is honestly kind of a bummer. Once again, I know there's a hard mode and you don't need to take the heal, but it would have been a great final challenge before the ultimate ending. 
Dispatching the eight villains leaves us with a choice. We can save them from a mighty fall or leave them to their fate. Y'all already know I can't take that kind of bad karma, so we're gonna save them. Really nice touch that King Knight compliments the golden armor. Also, Polar Knight just had to leave us with a real ominous note. Man, ominous really is the best description for this stage. Haunting melodies collide with the cathedralic windows. Floors rise and fall with both malice and indifference. They make the ground appear at such a short range that you never feel comfortable charging forward, making you hesitant yet dauntless in both mind and body. Then, we meet her. The Enchantress is actually Shield Knight, corrupted by the Dark Amulet on that faithful knight. We got a dual dilemma here. On one end, this fight is super sketchy, only a middle line of dirt for flooring and she will constantly break away massive chunks. On the other end, we have to fight the most important person in our life. The Dark Will taunts our situation, proposing that we dance once more into never-ending abyss. With enough turbulent damage, the Dark Lady rises to the peak of the chapel, shattering the stained glass, and with one last jolt of defiance comes one of the most touching moments I've ever seen in a game. All of those dreams were practice for an emotional apex to this game. Good thing I didn't goof that up. <laughs> Bad news. Turns out that darkness didn't just politely leave the mortal realm. It's up to you and Shield Knight to finish the fight once and for all. It's such a wonderful surprise to find the last brawl is a duo battle. You have to stick next to Shield Knight as she can deflect the projectiles and give you the needed boost to get up to that sweet spot. With perseverance, you will strike the final blow, sealing the Dark Force's fate. But they pull a Super Metroid on us, and we get O-Code. It's in this moment that we see the Black Knight once again. Shield Knight holds off the evil energy for as long as she can, begging him to save us. After a mild protest, he agrees, leaving our one true partner within the clutches of the castle. The tower falls, the village rejoices. From here, we see how this overwhelming wave of righteous power has affected the people and places we've seen along the way. I cannot overstate how great this segment is. They take the motif of each song from along our quest and remix it into this uplifting outpour of resolution, each turn of the screen being a golden reminder of our battle and the prosperity we've caused absolutely phenomenal resolution. Except for Polar Knight, there's no denouncement, just a shot of him longing in the horizon and another mixture of pensive energy to end the bad guy roll call. The Black Knight, true to his word, takes us back to our campfire, leaving us to rest in a swirl of relief and worry about how our final outcome would play out, all fading to credits. You simply cannot beat this feeling. The starry night of the background, the absolutely breaking pace of the credits theme, the fact that they put the any percent world record holder, which I have literally never seen a video game do. It all screams a completely earned finish to a team that was able to build the exact game they wanted to make. All it needs is a send-off message, something that hits way too hard for a silly little indie game. It's time we finally finish this thing. 
And what better way to do that than to talk about Shovel Knight's greatest quality, synchronicity. Each stroke of color this game has shines beautifully, brilliant shades of combat bouncing between sharp writing and satisfying progression, but above all else, this game has pulled hue into scope to create one illustrious painting. Like a concept album, each song plays a part to build the entirety of an idea, one brought from the depths of developers who love the work that they do and given the license and freedom to set a game into the world that makes a meaningful memory. Every now and then, you stumble onto something that directly changes who you are. A photo that strikes a personal chord, a movie that becomes a staple in how you see the world. But rarest of all, a game that plunges deep into your head and lives there. A beacon of satisfying resolve and sublime execution. It's the benchmark to how you see a genre, a masterpiece crafted by a team with terrifying control over their creative spark, a list of only a handful, a cozy pedestal of games that you can always rely on whenever you have that itch to wander down a beautiful road deep within yourself. Shovel Knight is not only one of my favorite games, but it is a perfect example of what we can accomplish without being hindered by additional hands. The fact that people, like me and you, were able to see the potential of this idea from an unproven company and grant the resources and patience needed to see it spirited to life is such a remarkable love. It's a synchrony one of sight and sound, but more importantly that of creator and audience, of past and future that makes this game so incredibly dear to me. And as miraculous and complete as this is, would you believe me if I told you that after the release of this game, without payment or promise, that Yacht Club released three additional campaigns, each rivaling the length and quality of this game? and that they did it all for free? That will be a video for another day. As for this story, I just simply want to end with a thank you. Once for the team at Yacht Club for this amazing game, and another for you, watching this video now. I can only hope that I will find more moments somewhere close to playing this game for the first time, especially when I can share them with all of you. Until next time, thank you. A huge shout out goes to the Patreon donators Lee, Happy, Josh Holtz, T Goldie, Turbo Drowsy, and Tyler. If you are interested in helping out the channel, becoming a patron, or even just joining the Discord, I will have links in the description. You may be wondering why the audio quality has dipped so much here in the credits, and that is because I do not have power. Um, it has been a very interesting past couple of days and so the video is over if you're not super interested feel free to close out but if anybody wants a behind the scenes of what's going on here the entire story is a little wild i know i have been gone for the past few months and i wish i super wish i had something juicy a big reason as to why that is but the reality of it is i just did not manage my personal, creative, and work-life balance super well, so I changed a couple of things into my life so that I would be able to make these videos. And a part of that was getting a new editing software. I swapped over from Filmora to Final Cut Pro, so I wanted to do a nice, tiny little video, just a little indie game, uh, something that I really love so it would be easy to write and I could get a handle on actually figuring out how to use this new software, and well, you see how that turned out. I finally get to a point where all the voiceover is done, all the video is attached, I just need to do finalization, so I go onto YouTube and I go to the Discord and I say the video is going to be done over the weekend. Just one more day of editing and we will be good to go. Not 10 minutes later, a giant storm rolls through my city and to this day, three days later, half of the city still does not have power. Your boy learned a couple of lessons from this occasion. Uh, first of which being, 
don't announce things unless you're done editing. You don't know when you'll lose power and then you'll have to scramble around to actually finish your project. Uh, second lesson, laptops, super big fan. Um, I don't think I will ever go to anything else into the future. I would not have been able to continue to work if I did not work with only mobile devices that I can take with me. And third and most importantly is never underestimate your friends and family. The past few days, I have been able to go to different houses, be able to completely set up an enormous, really outrageous amount of equipment so that I can continue to capture footage, continue to edit, and have my spot to be able to have internet and um, actually finish this video. So a massive shout out goes to my friends Caleb and Jake for their um, letting me actually go into their space and not only set up all of my stuff to be able to finish this video, but sitting down and helping me capture some footage that you actually saw in the video. So I want to pay that back just a little bit here. My buddy Jake is in a band and he makes experimental music, which I adore. If you're interested in something unique and something that's a little bit more innovative, I'm going to leave a link in the description to his band camp. Outside of that, I appreciate you all sticking with me. Um, I'm not going to set any deadline, not after uh, all of this that's been going down, but next video is already in the works. I will have that done as soon as possible. And most importantly, thank you all. Thank you for sticking with me. I hope you have a great rest of your day.